No, don't mourn him. He was dead long before we ever... Bastard! Oh, hush now. Everything's all right. Frank's here. <laughs> Bastard! Your dear old Uncle Frank. What the hell is that? for your eyes you set me up bitch uh hello folks welcome to the sin beef podcast i'm one of your hosts gary hill with you tonight is uh suzanne is here how you doing i'm doing well other than the fact that the media is trying to make me murder people at the grocery store yeah we, we'll all get over it you know so if he gets trampled it'll be all good that's just natural selection there sue you know survival of the fittest uh-huh. there you go it's all good be just fine, see? Uh, <laughs> and with me is a person that I haven't talked to in a bit on a podcast, and I, I, I always wonder if she's thinking about that. Then I try to cut to the chase, and there she is. Jamie's here. How you doing? You know? <laughs> I'm had, doing well. I had, you're... I had to bust your balls. I'm sorry, you know? Did to... <laughs> no, I mean, I, you're right, though. I mean, shit kept happening, um, but we finally made it, and I'm really excited. Mm-hmm. Not always my fault, I want to add. No, it's not. Like, I'm, I'm, just bust, <laughs> I'm just busting your balls, though. You know? But um, natural selection, as in people doing the giant straw challenge. Have you, <laughs> have you seen those idiots? Is there a giant straw challenge? Oh, God. Is this on TikTok Be- with those fucking morons? Or, it's, uh... it, I, I don't know. I saw clips of it that somebody had posted on Facebook. But um, it's basically people trying to drink with a toilet paper tube <laughs> and being shocked when they choke themselves. That's what <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, you're an idiot. Wow. <laughs> I have not even heard of this. But... I just saw it this morning. Look it up. It's really hilarious because people are idiots. So, <laughs> oh, God. but I am glad to be here. I'm glad to be with you guys. It's been way too long and uh, we're going to have fun. Yes, we are. Glad, glad you could, you are on with us. And I appreciate that. And, uh, since it's been so long, I'll ask Jamie first. What's she been watching lately? Oh, my goodness. A lot. Um, We have... I have my thing here. We have... uh, Well, I just watched... Today was the 116th movie this year. Nice. Um, And thanks to the state of the world these days, I'm going to have a lot more movie watching time coming up. Um, So I should be doubling that in about two weeks. But but, um, lately... We watched, uh, we're in the A's uh, of our, we finally, two years later, we have finally gotten to the A's yes. in our collection. So we watched most recently Apocalypse Now, uh, which, oh, wow. holy shit, that movie is so amazing. Oh, God, it's, it is. Every frame of that is just, uh, just gorgeous. It is gorgeous. And I, it, uh I can't even I can't even get over it. Like it's one of those movies where when we were watching it, I went to go I was in the middle of making dinner, so I went to go pull something out of the oven and Brian's like, You want me to pause it? And I'm like, Yeah. Um, I don't wanna miss like any bit of any of it. Not even a little bit of it. I can't afford to miss any of it because that's how much it that's how good it is. That's how much I love it. So that's a, that's been a highlight. I rewatched Arachnophobia for the first time in a while. And that stuff, that, I think it holds up really well. That's a fun movie. Um, we saw the new, the newest new Jumanji, which I had a whole lot of fun with. I, I think um, I'm going to like the next one better from what you get at the very end of the movie. Yeah, I think I'm, I'm going to have more fun with the next one. To, 
I'm really looking forward to that. It's fun. Uh, I think it'll be fun. I I love both of those, though. And so, but yeah, when we get to the end of the first one, or the second one, um, I'm like, ooh, is that going to be the third one? I want to see it. Um, We also watched Little Monsters, which was really fun. You know, little zombie movie with uh, Lupita Nyong'o, who, holy shit, is so pretty. She is. She has the most amazing skin. Like, there are scenes where... (laughs) She does. And I mean, like, it's so smooth and just like creamy looking when she there would be scenes where she's talking to someone and she was wearing like a sundress. So she's talking to someone and you can see her back and her shoulders and like her skin is flawless, just flawless. And then she's so pretty. I'm like, oh, um, but yeah, really, really enjoyed that. And of course, we watched the new Black Christmas, which I did not yeah. enjoy. <laughs> I'm talking about that, too. Trust me. <laughs> Mm. Um, and then things like uh, Anthropophagus, which has been forever um, since I saw that. But that was that was fun. Hey, if we ever want to do like a George Eastman double bill, that would be really fun to do with. Um, oh, what the hell is that other movie? Absurd. Uh, thank you. Absurd. <laughs> Absurd. <laughs> and um, which we also uh, watched not that long ago because it's also an A movie. But anyway, stuff like that. That's what we've been doing. Cool. Susan? Uh, I've actually been delving into a lot of television. So I've been watching it. This will make you laugh. I started watching The Shield. It's one of those shows that I always, I, keep, I catch an episode of here and there, but you have to watch the whole thing in a more linear sense. And since we picked up the all-access CBS, I started watching The Unicorn. So I'm getting two shades of Walton Goggins. Yeah. Hard-ass cop. Really nice dude. He always brings something to whatever he's in. He always does. Oh, he does. And I actually went and looked at his filmography. I'm like, Jesus Christ, I've seen him in about 50 fucking things. And I had a question for Jamie. There is a movie that's been on Shudder. And I have a feeling if you haven't seen it, you need to see it. It's called Tigers Are Not Afraid. Oh, man, that is a movie that I have been wanting to watch for a while because I it had it got so much buzz last year and I never got around to it. But I really, really want to. Have you seen it? Yes. It, OK, so you're it, saying was, you're saying it that I need to. OK, good. <laughs> yes, you, def- you definitely need to see this. This movie, because I watched it, I was kind of just trying to round out a bunch of 2019 horror movies and this is one of the last ones I watched, like up to like an hour before the show. And this movie fucking gutted me. It was so good, so sad, but it it ha- it hit all of the right notes. There was a heart to it nice. that I have not seen in a long time. Well, that is very so. cool. Well, I'm glad to hear. I'm glad to hear you say that because it has definitely been one that has been on my radar, but for whatever reason, I haven't pulled the trigger on it. So, so yeah, and we I, have I shut did, her, so. Yeah, I have. I did the same thing because I was afraid that a lot of the a lot of the movie was it was just hype. But I'm like, you know what? I just want to sit down and watch it. And I am so thankful I did. It was a beautiful piece of filmmaking. And on top of that, I ended up watching this thing on Prime. Everybody knows I have this thing. I love my hair metal. Love it. Love that era of music. Mm-hmm. Love old rock and roll. And there's a documentary called The Rainbow, all about the Rainbow Room on the Strip in Los Angeles. And it basically starts off more as an homage to Lemmy and the fact that he lived, like, three places down from there and he was there every day he loved playing those easy. fucking video machines on the bar yeah, I know. <laughs> but it is a love letter to everything i love about that era of music and i don't give any fucks whatsoever it was fantastic it i i it just i got the happy feels just for my just re- remembering how what it was like when new albums would come out by your favorite bands that just doesn't happen anymore 
and the music of the time. So yeah, if you're into that, I highly recommend The Rainbow. And yeah, other than that, Pat's been watch- making me watch these really bizarre conspiracy theory documentaries from these people that really need to get out of mom's basement. We actually watched something on the Lizard Man conspiracy last night, and there's an hour and a half of my life I'm never getting back. <laughs> Thanks, Pat. There you go. Price it was welcome. called, I really want to say it was called Above Majestic, streaming on Hulu, so... Do yourself a favor and don't watch it. That's about it. Man, oh man. Yeah, I, I finished Hunters, so there, there's that. And it ends It ends in a way to say, hey, you're really excited for next season or you're not really that excited for next season. And it, <laughs> it, it kind of it peters out a bit towards the end. But then you get an yeah. ending that this says, wow, this is a thing. And let, let's, let's see where this goes. Because, uh... I want one spoiler. Clones show up in the end of the episode, at the end of the end of the season. Okay, so yeah. Well, I was episode two aggravated me, and then Pat wanted to watch it, so I'm stuck at episode two. See, I think I think your boy uh, Percy Jackson, Lauren, uh, whatever his name is, Lerner, he, he gets weaker and weaker as the se- as the season goes on, which is my problem. This is supposed to be the guy you're supposed to be rooting for to be the hero to, to pick up pick up the pace for for his, his dead grandmother and, and he's a fucking pussy he's really a pussy and it, not in the sense of saying he kicked so. out somehow I don't, I don't know what happened yay oh my god yay you're back yeah it, Skype just shut down I don't know it's weird um what was I talking about last or what I was talking about last was it uh you were talking about Logan Lerman and Hunters and he's a big giant pussy yeah I'm gonna leave that one there and say that I watched Uncut Gems. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. <laughs> Uncut Gems is the thing that I watched with Adam Sandler. And, um, it's a good movie. I, 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 it deserves all, all the hype, although I don't think Adam Sandler was too dramatic in the film. I mean, he was kind of like a real happy go lucky dude considering all the shit he was in the film. Uh, basically, the plot of the film is he's, um, a Jewish diamond merchant. Uh, f- fancy that. And, uh, he, um, he gets a hold of an uncut diamond from Ethiopia and he's banking on selling it for big amounts because he owes a lot of money to these bookies and he, he keeps an extravagant lifestyle with his mistress and his wife and yada, yada, yada. So all these oppositions are going all at once as he's trying to sell it. First of all, he loses the diamond, then he has to find the diamond and then try to get, try to get rid of it you know, for a big amount and it all leads to where the end to where you think it's going to lead and yeah, it, it 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 doesn't either ends good or doesn't end good. It's, it's from the same guys that made that film Good Time with uh, Robert Pattinson. I think it's the, the the Softer Brothers or something like that. I forget their names, but they're brothers and they they make films. But um, it's worth their time. I think. Um, I just don't think this is like his best dramatic work ever. Like like oh wow, he deserves an Oscar. No, not really. It's just a good movie he's in, and uh, I will say that. Other thing I watched is uh, that 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 Black Christmas thing that came out last year, and mm-hmm. <laughs> I got this for two dollars. So I figured, yeah, if I'm gonna hate watch something, I, I might it might as well be this. And uh, I wasn't disappointed as far as the hate watching goes because it is it is is not good, and it does it, it follows certain beats, especially in the beginning of the movie, to where you know this film is. Uh, it's written by fe- written by females and directed by a female, and that's great. I-, I love females in the industry, but if your first two minutes of your film has your per- your girls, your, your, the girls are they're supposed to be the heroes of this movie, call each other bitches. I'm not I'm not big on that in any sense, whether it's casual or in a movie. I mean, you got you got real you know bo hunk dudes calling women bitches like it's nobody's business. But don't don't get offended if a man calls you a bitch, you know, in the sense saying, "Oh, how dare you!" It's like, no, you're calling each other bitches, and this this is my problem, you know. You show them more, more respect for yourself, and don't refer to each other as bitches, because it's not cute. Okay. It's not cute at all. Here's my problem. Huh? I grew up watching female directors, uh-huh. Penelope Spheris, Susan Seidelman. They never had to resort to the lowest common denominator, and that seems to be what a lot of the newer 
generation of female directors are doing. Yeah. And, and honestly, piss me off. Yeah, I don't I want mean, you guys it to watch. piss me off. Because men, uh, even the good guys in the movie can't be good guys. You know, it's like it, they're not they're not allowed to be good guys all the way through the movie. They they have to at some point come under control of the the badness. And it's, you know, basically it's saying, you know, all, all men are weak and there's and they are inclined to be you know, rapey assholes. No, it's not the way it is. Stop it. You know, misandry is not going to get us anywhere. You know, and this film is not feminist. It's straight up misandrist and it's ridiculous. And I just was angry through the whole thing. Brian didn't like it for a lot of technical reasons. He just didn't think it was a good movie. I was pissed off, straight up pissed off at the message because it's aimed right at young girls. And this is not what we should be teaching them. So I just, ugh. not to mention the fact that it just, they got on my nerves. And, and misogyny, oh. and misogyny comes from black goo that comes dripping from a statue in this movie. So they get, oh, God. They get all supernatural with it. And <laughs> so I'm spoiling it for you. So you don't have to watch this movie because it's not good. It's, it's not good at all. Oh, you want to watch a really good outing by a female writer director? Tigers are not afraid. Isa Lopez. Go there instead. Watch something that has, like, a fucking soul to it. So, so all, all you candy asses that are bitching about the one from, like, 2005 that I happen to kind of enjoy, actually. Um, oh, I don't like that one either, but it's for very different reasons. It's very brutal, and I enjoy that aspect of it. The, the whole part with the flesh cookies and all that, the technical bullshit like that. I wasn't, <sighs> I wasn't a fan of that. But, you know, as far as, like, the killer and the gore, I thought it was on point. And, uh... I actually like it a little bit better than the original one. I'm not going to lie to you. Just just a little bit. Oh, you just hurt my soul. Well, I don't but... like the original one. <laughs> I don't like the original one that much. L- listen, I know. Listen to, I know. Um, there's an episode with me and Ryan Lewis talking about it, and I think I, I, I broke him. You broke Ryan? <laughs> I think like so. <laughs> oh, he's a good man, though. Um, yeah, that's about all I watched, really. You know, I'm, I'm going to leave it at that and uh, kick it to... Our next segment, we talked a good hour before the show, by the way, about some major beefage, but uh, this is the beef bitch to match potatoes. Okay, who gets the burly uh, beef? I ordered barbecue beef. I think that's mine, but I didn't who order gets fries. Barbecue beef? Mine's the juke deluxe. Okay, who gets the burly beef? I heard that. Jamie? Mm-hmm. What's, what's what's your beef, girl? Oh, man, so many things. <laughs> I mean, look around. We're just surrounded by assholes. <laughs> Throw a rock, why it don't you? It's driving me nuts just seeing how assholish people are. Um, and, and, like, I get that at a time like this, people are concerned. People are afraid. That's mainly it. They're afraid. But... What pisses me off is, and Suzanne brought this. Might actually be her, so I won't steal it if it is. But um, the, the public is being pushed by, uh, pushed into fear, and it's not. That's not helping anything. It's only making things worse. And there are precautions that we're taking that make sense, but at the same time, uh, there are things that don't make any sense. You know, um, like that. The people are not going to stop producing toilet paper. Like, it is not going to be, we're we're not, and like Suzanne said earlier off air, you're not going to get explosive diarrhea if you get the coronavirus. So settle down, (laughs) buy what you need, and leave the rest for people who need it too. Like, there's just no reason to hoard. And honestly, there's no reason for it to go missing at all because, on any other, you should be going through the same amount of toilet paper that you have always gone through. Nothing is going to change. Now, I understand that you don't want to leave your house, but I think it's just it's, people are taking it too far to the extreme, and it's it's ridiculous. And it's making me honestly. I had to go to the store and legitimately buy some, and I didn't want to do it. I didn't want to do it because I didn't want to look like that guy. And I, you know, that's ridiculous. You know, it's, 
Also, laundry detergent. I legitimately needed laundry detergent. I didn't expect that aisle to be empty. What the fuck is up with that? Why are you suddenly doing so much laundry? Like, <laughs> what does that have to do with anything? But it's just... It, it, people just panic and they have to get everything. And it's like, I just need, I need this and I need this and I need this and I don't need anything but this remote and this, <laughs> and this chair. <laughs> like, stop. But, uh, and, it, and what, even then, the thing that makes me angry about it is that the fact that people are fighting each other or being violent to one another. That's yeah, not... Yeah, that's the one thing that scares me the most is someone is going to pop a cap in someone's yeah. ass over a roll of toilet paper. Yeah. And it will happen. It will happen. Oh, it will. It's only a matter of when. And that's it. Yep. <laughs> Suzanne. Well, I'm going to expand upon this a little bit more because the media should be keeping everybody calm, providing facts. But no, all they're doing is creating a frenzy. And I, yeah, I knew that was going to be yours. That's why I didn't, that it, I didn't. Oh, no, no, no. I, <laughs> I, I feel free to jump in on this at <laughs> any time because I know we're all feeling the same thing. I'm being calm. I, the worst that's going to happen is I'm stuck in my house for two weeks. I've got thousands of movies and several channels. I will be fine. I'm just afraid someone's going to come tapping on my fucking door to steal shit. Yeah. But the media is, once again, I, I am so disgusted with journalism because you're not telling anybody what's going on. All you're doing is sitting there looking at the camera with your blank fucking face going, it's time to panic. You better get this. You better get that. You better do this. Stay home. Don't go anywhere. You better. And, oh, my God. Now, you're not helping anybody with this. It's the fucking flu. Get the fuck over it. And I really hope a lot of these people are when the when this is all said and done, someone needs to be accountable for some of the shit that's going to happen. You know it's going to happen. I know it's going to happen. I just don't want it to happen in my backyard. Yeah. I mean, nothing is scarier than frightened human beings. Yeah. You know, that's how people get trampled in if the, if a fire breaks out in a building, you know, or like, you know, even in Jaws, you know, when when he blew the whistle because they saw the shark in the water and then the old man gets knocked down and and trampled to death. Yeah. I mean, it's that's how people get killed is not because of the thing itself, because of people's reaction to it. And I'm not concerned about it. I mean, I probably will get sick, of, you know, but and then, you know, we'll see what happens. But that's not even my biggest concern right now. My biggest concern is how everybody's going fucking nuts and also how currently it's affecting everything financially. And that right now is my biggest scare, my biggest worry. But um, that the, the financial ramifications and the crazy ass people, those are the two things I'm most concerned about. I know my husband works. He goes to facilities all over the world. He was supposed to be in Poland in two weeks. Then we have the big dog and pony show downtown, which is, this is where everybody showcases their stuff. This is where a lot of sales are made and a lot of people continue to keep their jobs. Well, you're going to see, I'm, I'm, that is the one thing that scares me almost as much as somebody freaking out and shooting someone over a roll of toilet paper at my local jewel. Oh, sorry. That's, I don't. Someone needs to be held accountable for the panic that's been created. I'm calm. My mother is calm. I'm like, Mom, just make sure you have some extra stuff in the fridge. Forget about it, you know? I mean, look, look, yeah, look, so look, look at Tom Hanks. A perfect example of handling something with class. You know, him, him mm-hmm. and his wife were in Australia. And they felt they oh, felt ill. They felt weak, amazing. you know. And they said, "We're going to get checked out." And then his statement, you know, he he wasn't feeling sorry for himself. He wasn't saying, "Go run to your local go grocery store and ransack it." He was just saying, yeah. oh, "We're, we're going to sit here. We're, we're going to take the time a lot that we're supposed to have, and we're going to ride it out." And that's that's all he yeah. says, you know. His statement yeah. was absolutely it was perfection. It was total perfection. 
I loved every Isn't that how the media it. should have handled but, it? Yes. You notice how calm he was? How, you know, um, and he oh, yeah. said, he's like, you know, eh, we had some aches and pains, some slight fever, some chills. So we went to the doctor and yeah, we're positive. But, you know, we're just going to, we're going to ride Sit it in out. in a hotel room you know? and wait it out. You know, we're not like that. Like, we're not fucking stupid. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I, I, have I, no, I have no people besides this, you know. It's just it's the stuff going on. People well, I said this jobs. plane. I mean, slowing down jobs. I worry about yeah, New I, because uh, Disneyland closed today, so his job could be closed down next. He he works uh, on the other side of the, 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 the country in Florida it, for Disney. And, I uh, yeah, he's worried people's jobs and what they're going to do if... Uh, Trump's bailout doesn't go through by saying, and I, I will give him some class class points here. I don't know how true it is about him trying to make folks whole if, if they're out of work, you know, during the time this yeah. is going on, you know. But we'll see how that plays yeah. out. So, it's a well, I heard him say specifically people who are either sick or caring for those who are sick or quarantined. I, d- but I don't know what his what if if any plans they have for people who are just fucked because their job is ruined, you know? Yeah. So I don't know. And that, that honestly makes me nervous, but you know, like I said, we'll just have to kind of, I mean, as it is, it's already hitting home. Um, it hits, it hit home for Suzanne, um, and Pat it's hitting home for me. And I didn't expect it to happen that fast, but it fucking happened overnight. And I mean, like literally overnight, we were okay. Yeah. One day there were a whole bunch of meetings. And then the next day it's like, bam, the ax fell down. And, and, um, my property, all of the, our staff was basically cut in half and it's, so it's dire. It's really, really bad. That concerns me. I don't know what, I mean, I'm getting emails from my credit card company saying, you know, hey, we understand that, every, that people are going to be going through hard times. Let us know how we can help. And I'm like, really? What are you going to do? I mean, what are you, what are you going to do for six months? Right. I mean, like, what are you going to do? Because that would cripple them. You know, they can't they can't really do much. But, you know, thanks for trying to make it's a double-edged better. sword. <laughs> and so. I said this when we were talking earlier that I actually yelled at someone at the grocery store because she decided to clear the entire rack of hand soap. That's all of it. I mean, this is going to be gone in a few months and she's going to have hand soap to get her through till what? Late 2029. Mm -hmm. And I said to her, like, other people need to wash their hands too. And this woman glared at me. And other people were kind of looking at her, and they should have given her the stink eye, too. Did she put any of it back? Nope. And I think, I'm sorry, stores should limit that. Two hand sanitizers, two packs of toilet paper. I got emails from a grocery store about this, and yeah, they're just going through. They're enforcing at certain places. Well, they need to do that all over, because this is bullshit. It's... Once again, it's just, it's this panic that's been created that is just going to make things terrifying for a while. Uh, yeah. I, All right, I, I'm we, done, bitching. No, it's, it's cool. No. So basically, if you got any from this conversation, uh, our beepers are lovely listeners and, and friends. Uh, be considerate. Be responsible. Don't be an asshole to your fellow man. So if anything, yeah, this, this is to learn us is to treat your, your, your fellow man better. And maybe check in on a neighbor or something like that, you know, because uh, I realize it's a very real thing, but people uh, as a collective can make it worse. And I'm going to leave it at that. And uh, I'm sure my co-hosts agree with me on that, you know. It's, uh... yeah, absolutely. Oh, my God. Speaking of tonight, though, we're talking about hell on earth, people. Much like we're living in right now, see? But in a much more fun way and a torturous way in some senses. Uh, I picked two films. Basically about two guys who escape from hell and um, the Harbingers who intend to bring them back. Uh, we're doing Drive Angry from 2011. And the, the classic uh, we haven't done yet. Hellraiser from 1987. Uh, fancy that, right? <laughs> <laughs> People don't know that movie at all. Just throwing it out there, you know. Uh, 
<laughs> but I think we'll start with Drive Angry. Uh, first, right from the trailer. Tell him I'm coming. You're too late. Hell's gonna walk the earth. Hell already is walking the earth. Broke out of hell to make things right. He was a good father. And God makes up with the wrong crowd. Now, he's got one last shot at redemption. That cult killed my daughter and took her baby. I am going to get her back. Thought you were dead. <laughs> you hoped I was dead. But the devil's right-hand man wants to bring him back. I'm looking for someone. 6'1", angry with attitude. If you don't tell me what I want to know. <sighs> 22 miles of hard road. Now that's a hell of a ride. Just so you know. I don't pick up hitchhikers. I didn't have my thumb out. Oh, yeah. We got a fight coming. That baby girl's all I got. My whole life has been nothing but waiting, and now it means something. I'm with you until the end. Oh, yeah. You can't stop me. I am going to kill you. Between now and then, I'm gonna mess you up. What kind of gun is that? You think there's anybody in there? I won't see you again until you're 73. You all see in three months. What the hell does that mean? Drive angry, shot in 3D. Wouldn't want to be you when Satan finds out. What's he gonna do? Not let me back in? Drive Angry from 2011. Uh, this, of course, is a uh, rated R in 3D. Uh, your basic plot synopsis is a vengeful father escapes from hell and chases after the men who killed his daughter and kidnapped his granddaughter. Uh, this is directed by Patrick uh, Lucier. Is it's, it's French? I'm sure. You know? mm-hmm. uh, I think he gave us um, the My Bloody Valentine remake, which I, I enjoy. Mm. I'll cut it out, Sue. <laughs> <laughs> um, written by Patrick Lucier and, and Todd Farmer, who let me tell you, um, gave Loves me one of those, showing his ass. Yeah, but he he gave me. Yeah, he's in this movie showing his ass, but he. He gave me Jason X, and I, I, I appreciate him for that every time I watch it, because it's my kind of silly. Kind of like this movie, but um, this stars Nicolas Cage uh, as as John Milton. Fancy that, you know? <laughs> uh, Amber Heard, who I can't even look at anymore. I'm sorry. After the stuff with Johnny Depp, it just is crazy. Uh, allegedly, That's funny, because when we were watching this, I said, I don't give a shit how crazy she is. That girl's hot. <laughs> yeah, she's good looking. She is. <laughs> Uh, David Moore shows up in this movie. Brian's response was, I'd let her beat me up. <laughs> yeah, well, there's that, yeah. Um, Tom fucking Atkins shows up in this movie, as, of course, you guessed it, a cop. And uh, the guy who's having the most fun in this movie, uh, William Fick- Fick- uh, uh, Fick- Fickner, there you go. I can't pronounce his fucking name. Fick- Fickner, there you go. Plays the accountant, of, of all things. I, I love the, his role in this movie. He's like the most fun in this movie. And uh, Billy Burke as Jonah King, our satanic leader. Um, I know Suzanne hasn't seen this before since before the show. Have you seen it before, Jamie? No, I never had. Well, I'm, I'm gonna let you got Jamie kick it off first. It's been a while since he's been on the show, so go ahead. Um, uh, you sent me. Yes. Jamie. Okay. I um, yeah, I'd never seen this before. I I remember when it came out. I saw the trailers for it, and I remember it getting good reviews. And I'd wanted to see it, but I just never got around to it. So when you brought this up, that's one of the reasons why I was excited. Now, Hellraiser is Hellraiser, like, duh. But I I was excited to get the opportunity to see this movie. 
And so I asked Brian, I'm like, have you ever seen this? He's like, yeah, it's pretty good. And I'm like, okay. So that means he's willing to watch it with me when I watch it. For <laughs> so, um, <laughs> when, um, so then, uh, but I didn't know anything about it. I remembered the poster. I remembered Amber Heard being in it. And I remembered Nicolas Cage being in it. And that is it. Like, I didn't know anything else. I didn't know what the plot was. I had no idea what was, I didn't even, I had no idea it was going to be any kind of, supernatural or religious thing. I knew nothing about that. I thought it was like a heist movie or something. You know, I, I didn't have a clue. So when, when it started and I was just like, well, and then it's incredibly violent, but like a really fun kind of violent, you know, it's just body parts flying everywhere, people flying everywhere and just crazy violence. So that's always fun. Naked people all over the place. So hell yes, this movie is rated R. Um, and I think it's kind of funny that Amber Heard was whipping up uh, on a bunch of men and this like just kicking the shit out of uh, just like punching Todd Farmer in the face repeatedly. And uh, I was like, little did anyone know. Um, <laughs> but she, um, see, I think she did a really good job in this movie. Like I, en I enjoyed her character. I enjoyed her. Uh, Nicholas Cage though was uh, he was phenomenal with his Cage rage. It. Like I said, I had no idea what it was going to be when I went into it, but I enjoyed the ride all the way through, and it was just just high-octane violence and driving and cars and blood and naked people, and uh, it, was, it was really, really fun. So I had a good time. Suzanne. Yeah, this was also a first-time watch for me. I knew absolutely nothing about this movie and it's like i've got two favorite nicholas cages mom and dad nicholas cage where he's just like ah! <laughs> and i like my subtle nicholas cage which is valley girl yeah and then some of the he's done some shitty movies let's just admit that yeah but this was this was he was actually slightly controlled in this movie my favorite character was william fichter being the accountant he was my favorite part of this movie he, he, was great. Ate, uh, he ate up so much scenery in this movie every time he was on camera he was fucking gold and i had no idea that this was a 3d movie until they were going over the bridge and all of a sudden car parts start flying everywhere and like oh wait there's nothing from the car miss oh wait they did this in 3d all right, I gotcha. But it's just, it's fun. There's boobs and in Nicolas Cage, like, banging this chick, drinking whiskey, oh. Bellamy, <laughs> shooting people up. Whilst keeping the cigar and his Jack Daniels intact. Yeah. Uh, a little Jack Daniels did spill, but I blame that on her screaming, oh, where's that cop? Where's that cop? She was still getting it, too, while he was killing those but people. No, this was just fun. This is... What are those movies you put on for your friends when you want something with a lot of action? You know, it's just fun. I, if it wasn't for the the opening scene or the ending scene, you would have no idea that he had pretty much uh, escaped from hell. So yeah. yeah, it was. It's fun. It's 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 a good, you know, cage rage movie. Enjoyable as hell. But William Fechner steals the scene and honestly tom atkins for the short amount of time he's on screen is just primo it's pretty good even yeah i just david morse i actually stopped liking him after i saw him for the few the handful of episodes he was in in house so it's for some reason that just put a bad taste in my mouth where he's concerned but he's a great actor so yeah he was he was kind of cool in this movie, as opposed to me disliking him over. I didn't like the character he played. Hmm. But yeah, fun movie. Well, let me read some of these. If you ever seen the film, I'm going to read some of these exchanges to you, okay? Especially F Fickner, who's having the most fun in this fucking movie. The accountant goes, you, fat fuck, come here. And it's the guy that <laughs> says, what'd you call me? What'd you just call me? He said, I called you fat fuck. And we better leave it at that, unless you prefer I call you d dead fat fuck, okay? He's having <laughs> fun in this fucking movie. Oh, my God. 
Oh, the I part- love it when he's talking I'm to the sorry. two kids and he's like, um, he's like, not even close. I'm not going to see you again until you're 73. You, I'll see you in three months. And oh, then he walks so off and the kid's so like, good. what does that mean? <laughs> so good. <laughs> And the, the lie, the classic lie for Nick Cage, you know, while while his erect penis, I'm sure, is still inside of uh, the woman, uh, the prostitute, he goes, Candy. goes, Candy, she goes, oh, baby, why don't you fuck naked? He goes, I never disrobe before a gunfight. And he just starts killing people while he's still inside yeah. of the prostitute. You know, oh, my gosh. I, I haven't looked down to see if he was doing a pelvic thrust or not, but I'd imagine he was still giving it to her as he was killing these people. You know, I, I don't know, but. If you're not even for the end for this movie, it's, it starts with Nicolas Cage driving a muscle car out of hell, okay? And and then it ends with Nicolas Cage drinking that same Jack Daniels out of the skull of his enemies. Yeah. Okay? <laughs> so so if you're not in for the, for that fun ride, then I don't know if you're my friend or not, because this is a fun, it's, it's a dumb, fun movie all the way through. It has Satanists in it acting stupid. Hillbilly Satanists acting stupid. And, Do know, they not you, remind you of the cult from Far Cry? Yeah, I don't uh, play like the game. Far Cry Five. I never played the game ever. Sorry. Uh, I, anybody out there who who has? They reminded me of the cult from Far Cry. Okay. I mean, that was pretty much exactly the same. I mean, they even dressed the same, and they had the same like they taught. It was like dead on. Um, but I love cults. Like I I love movies about cults and and like crazy satanic people or crazy religious people. And that, High five. yeah. <laughs> and when that uh, that was that element was introduced, I'm like, oh my god, how how could this get any better? Like, what what more <laughs> could I possibly want? I mean, like like, like you guys said, it's it's, it's a three it's made for 3D, so you got like a lot of like bullet time stuff, which is neat because Nick Cage steals from somebody a god killer gun, and there's only thing he can kill the accountant and. Once he gets a look at it, like, yeah, I'm fucked now, and the the, the bullet flies, and I forget, something in Latin's written on it, and then scratches him across the face. He has a scar throughout the whole movie, and um, it's just fun watching the deterioration of this character throughout the movie, because he's, he's dead, but he can still get beat up. He's not, he's, not, he's not the accountant. The accountant is, like, you know, the angel. A devil. That, yeah, the devil that's come after <laughs> to get him, uh, like a reaper, and... He cannot be killed on on this plane of existence except with that one gun, and it's just their exchanges are fun. Um, the accountant, there's a scene with the accountant, and, it, and I, I I hate to keep mentioning him, but he's the most fun part about this movie, and that's a shame because it's a Nick, Nick Cage vehicle. But he, <laughs> I forget what's playing on the radio, but <laughs> so these people, he's driving this tanker truck, and it's, it's just, he's listening to, oh, what is it now? Oh God! This could drive me nuts. Oh my gosh! Let me, let me look real fast while whilst we're talking. I'm sure I can find it very quick. I got it open now. Dun 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 dun. dun. My gosh! Sorry about this, guys. Oh, I'm dun, 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 I'm looking too. Yeah. Dun, 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 dun. That's the way I like it. The, the Casey the Sunshine Band song, but some, played by somebody else, and he's just like whistling. While he's driving his tanker truck through the, through, through, the, through the blockade, and I love it every time I see it, and um, it's just a fun fucking movie, and they make it fun. I mean, this film has a very thin plot. If you've seen Race with the Devil, you know it, it's it's kind of like that kind of cult, except they're really imbued by the power of Satan, apparently. Because yeah, it it gets really real at the end there. But he gets annoyed when you when you sacrifice children in his name. Yeah. Which I thought was funny. Yeah, I, I thought, and it's just fun, and it, it has a big, big action set piece at the end. You know, kill a lot of Satanists, kill a lot of. It, it's filled with big action set pieces, though. And like, people getting run over left and right, uh, thrown out of windows. I could just like that one chick who got thrown out of the window of the camper. Then she rolls out into the street and starts shooting at the back of Nicolas Cage's car, which is chasing the camper. And then out of nowhere, like this other car just whoom, like right, just yeah, runs right over her, flattens her and ass. She gets like just thrown. I that to me was just that's the kind of thing that was happening constantly. It is impossible to get bored with something like that. Like you just, you can't. It's so fun. Well, this is one of the few movies I can actually say that the CGI blood splat really enhanced it. 
Because when he shot that dude's hand off, he just all of a sudden is like, boom! It, it is obliterated. And I just started laughing my ass off. Yeah, I gotta mention, because, you know, the cars in the film are, are gorgeous, the ones that Nick Cage drives, and uh, you have a 60, oh. 64 Buick Riviera, a 69 Dodge Charger, a 71 Chevy Chevelle, and a 57 Chevy Chevy 150. And they're all, they're all beautiful cars in this movie, and that it really enhances, you know, the, the fact that, you know... Yeah, and they fuck them up. They fuck them up, man, but I'm sure they, they, there was a lot of stunt cars in there. I'm not sure, though. Um, oh, I love the fact that the Chevelle had that scratch right straight across the middle of the roof, where the tanker trunk went over it. Yeah. And they kept that instead of making sure everyone forgot about it. There's a little attention, the attention, of the movie. Attention, attention details in there. Yeah, it's good stuff. Yeah, there's some nice continuity. I appreciate that. But yeah. It's like in... Um, on, sorry. In uh, Gone in 60 Seconds, the, the remake with Cage. Yes. When he fucks up that Shelby, <laughs> it makes me want to cry. Like, I just... <laughs> That car is amazing. And then, like, by the time you get to the end of the movie, it's barely going. And I'm like, oh, why? <laughs> but, it's like, or, like, when the Ferrari goes flying out the window at the at the end of Ferris Bueller, you know? Some, 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 paint, <laughs> some, some paint, some polish, you're good to go. Come on, uh, yeah. you know? <laughs> I love so. Gone in 60 Seconds. Like, that's a movie. That's where I. That's where I get my one... Impression of um, oh, what's his name? Oh no, I actually get the impression from he plays the cop in Gone in sixty seconds, but I get the impression of him from Congo. Yes, you do. Or, the, the, the sesame uh, cake, do it. We yeah. want to hear it. You know. You know. <laughs> Stop eating my sesame cake. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and she may make, make her do. It. You got to make her do it. You know. It's, it's fine. Yeah. <laughs> but. Anyway, I know we're not talking about gun, but that Gone in sixty seconds honestly would have been a fun movie to do with this, just because Nicholas Cage and cars. One day, yeah. I mean, I, I can recommend all day long going to listen to Bo's uh, pick six movies episode because it's fucking hilarious. But um, yeah, do that. That's amazing. Um, but Jamie, anything else you want to say about the film? And what do you give it one to ten? Uh, I don't. Th- I think we pretty much covered it i mean there's not a whole lot going on plot wise it's very simple you know um nicholas cage breaks out of hell he has to go save his little infant granddaughter from these cult people and he has until midnight on the next full moon to do it meanwhile he's being chased by the accountant who has to take him back so i mean that's pretty much what that is it that's the movie but what is what is just incredibly phenomenal about it is how much fun it is. So if you've never seen it, if, if you're out there and you've never seen it, like I had never seen it, I do it. Like make a point to see it because it's totally worth it. And uh, I'm going to uh, I'm going to give it an eight. Cool. That's fair. Uh, Suzanne. William Fechner steals this movie, completely steals it. The first movie I ever remember seeing him in was Drowning Mona. And whenever he's on screen, it's just in the back of my head, it's like, I'm a battered husband. In this, he owned it. I mean, he owned every scene. He hammed it up. He was fucking amazing in this movie. He He's the one who made this movie for me. This movie was just a blast to watch. The cars were awesome. One of the few occasions where the CGI blood splat. Truly enjoyed it. Yeah, I'm pretty much, I'm at like seven and a half out of ten. I fucking loved it. I can't wait to show this to a couple of my friends. Cool. Uh, one thing I got to break up is uh, <laughs> Freddy's Nightmares Connection, Suzanne. Michael DeLuca Productions uh, made, made this movie. Oh, yeah, I know. <laughs> I actually wrote that down when I was watching this. Yeah, that's that's the principal guy who made most of the phrase nightmares. If you're not listening to Burning for Springwood, uh, please do because we watch the garbage for you and uh, <laughs> check it out. Um, yeah, I had to bring that one up. No, I, I yeah, I, I I've heard this is a fun 3D experience. I've never experienced it that way, but I can see by the special effects they used uh, how they would pop on screen with 3D. So kudos to, to the production company for doing it the way they did it and uh, attracting that crowd. And uh, it's kind of dead now, the 3D thing. But, you know, here we are. This is fun, though. 
It's it's a good. It's worth the time. It's a fun turn your brain off. Watch motherfuckers get f- squibs for God's sake, squibs because they had them in this movie. Shotgun blast to the chest. It wasn't all CG. You could see you know the the, the gore popping out. I loved it. I loved it for that reason. He very rare in two thousand. Uh, what was it? Fourteen film. Yeah, 2004, 2011, but still, there everything was CG back in these days, too. And they went pretty brutal with it. And I love it. I'm going to give it an 8 out of 10 as well, because it's just wild as shit. And you guys nice. should watch it. Oh, gosh. But up next, we're going to do a film that nobody's seen before, because, you know, whatever. Uh, <laughs> Hellraiser from 1987. Here's the trailer. I have seen the future of horror. His name is Clive Barker. Hellraiser, beyond any terror you have imagined. A nightmare. No. Unlike anything you have witnessed, <laughs> is born. Because within these walls, the unholy is unleashed. Hellraiser from 1987. Uh, your Chico plot synopsis is this. An unfaithful wife encounters the zombie of her dead lover. The, de- the-, the demonic Cenobites are pursuing him after he escaped their sadomas- sadomasochistic underworld. Yeah, there's there's a little more to it than that, IMDb. Go eat a dick or something. This is, uh, <laughs> yeah. this is written and directed by Clive Barker. Um, this stars a, a cast of characters, most of which I have met before. So there's that. Uh, Andrew Robinson. Uh, Claire Higgins, Ashley Lawrence, who just gets finer with age. God damn. Uh, Sean Chapman, Uncle Frank. Uh, Oliver Smith is Frank the Monsters. You get two 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 characters playing the same person. And then you got the Cenobites, you know, who, um, Doug Bradley, who's just lead Cenobite at this point, who's going through some shit right now. Bless you, Doug. You're one of the nicest guys in the world, man. Um, Nicholas Vince is the Chatterer. Simon Bamford is, is the Butterball Cenobite. And, um... Iconic. That's all I'll say about that. You know, I'm going to kick it to Suzanne first, and this is a dumb question, but what do you think about Hellraiser? Okay, this is my top, in my top three favorite movies of all time. I remember renting this. I was like maybe a junior in high school. I rented the VHS tape because I'd never heard of it. It never showed on any screens around me. I don't know I, it, what kind of a release it got, but I rented this. I saw this. I looked at this and I'm like, oh, my God, this is everything that horror should be. I really hope it's as good as it looks. So I proceeded to have it for a two-day rental and watched it eight times. And then I read The Hellbound Heart, which I, I don't – I can see where it came from, but the movie is just – one of the most visually stunning and graphic and bloody and fucking perfect horror movies ever made. And I love, I didn't even realize it until I was watching Leviathan that Andrew Robinson was the Scorpio killer in Dirty Harry. Oh, yeah. I kept kept looking at his face. I'm like, I know, I know you. I know, I know you. And I never even bothered consulting IMDb. But yeah, he was the Scorpio killer. He was the sniper. Mm-hmm. Like, holy shit. But the this is what I miss about horror. This movie is downright scary. It's not hidden in dark. It, the, the scenes aren't dark. You see 
monsters. You see scary fucking monsters who are trying to reclaim someone who escaped them. And they will stop at nothing. When the bricks start falling away from the walls and you just get this glimpse and this these terrifying monsters coming out, I was I was in awe. This movie, there are a handful of movies that redefine the entire genre for me. And this was one of the big ones. They brought the gore back. They brought, it, there's a story. It's a good story. Not seen a lot of movies that brought that back to the screen. But it was well written with goddamn amazing gore. Oh my God. And after watching it, Yes, I mentioned Leviathan, but a Leviathan is about the making of Hellraiser 1 and 2, and you get to talk to everybody. And my favorite things that they talk about were going to every drugstore in the area and buying latex condoms mm-hmm. and KY jelly. That little drip on Frank's chin, because you have to admit that thing is mesmerizing whenever it's on screen. KY jelly. So, yeah, this movie is about as close to perfection as it gets in horror. There's, I can't, and believe me, I really am trying to come up with a fault. I haven't got one. I have one, but it's a really small thing. We've talked about this before, Suzanne. <laughs> I know we have. Yes. But, and I also, um, I have a signed picture that I won at Gary's auction. And believe me, I was going to the mat for that. I, this this movie, like I said, it's everyone has like some very defining movies in their life, and this is one of mine. Eight times over a weekend, I would after the movie was over, I rewound it and I would watch it again. I was inviting my friends over who were getting faint, turning green, and getting sick. Pussies. Yeah, this this movie. Yeah, I, that's when you know you're doing it right. Someone leave after I turned on Cannibal Holocaust. Bye. <laughs> man, oh man. You know, the video yeah. store was probably pissed. They had to buy a whole new copy after you turned it back in. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that I did. I wore it out. And then the second I got my allowance, I went to every place that sold VHS tapes and I bought my own damn copy of it. <laughs> and I think I've gone through two DVDs. Yeah, someone got me a really nice Blu-ray for Christmas, so I'm pretty well, I'm, I'm stocked on Hellraiser, but this movie is perfection. The, like I said, it's horror was scary again. There was something different, and I love a good slasher movie, but damn it, give me some fucking demons. Damn, they're amazing. Man, Jamie. Okay, uh, this the film has always meant a lot to me, too. It's one of the ones that is featured heavily around our home. Um, we showcase pretty much all the spectrum of horror from the universal classics to the modern day slashers to zombie films. Like there's something representative of just about anything in our house. But Hellraiser is one of the ones that you'll see pretty much from whatever angle you look. You'll either see a lament configuration sitting somewhere, or you'll see a pit. we have a pinhead and a chatterer up there. You go back here to this one, we have all the little figurines of everybody. Like, it's just, it's, oh, and for Christmas, I just got Brian the lament configuration tissue box holder, which, by the way, um, Suzanne, if you're interested in picking up, because I think you'd love it, uh, I got it off Etsy. So, Oh, nice. Check. Go check it out. It's really very cool. It's it's wooden. It's handmade, um, and it's it's amazing. So this movie struck me as on so many different levels. I love the score. To me, the score is incredibly haunting, and it's one of those ones that as soon as you hear the first couple of strains of it, the entire movie comes back to your head, and. I love when that happens. Uh, Pinhead, before he was Pinhead, (laughs) was always so captivating. You know, he has that, uh, Doug Bradley has that voice that is just, it's like booming and deep and um, it kind of gives you the chills. You know, it's just like that, that right kind of, he has that timber in his voice that just kind of 
goes all over you, kind of like Tony Todd and Candyman. Um, and he's actually one of my horror crushes. Uh, not Doug Bradley, but Pinhead. Um, if you, um, I have a whole album on in my Facebook profile of my horror crushes, and and Pinhead is in there. And it's just, I've always enjoyed him because it's a very simple thing. But when at the end they finally catch up to Frank, and they're going to do do what they do. Oh man! And. Um, she's st- like she's standing in the room, and he's like, you know, this is not for your eyes. Sorry, I had to cough. Um, okay. he's like, uh, this is not for your eyes. It, even though they then try to get her, even though she fulfilled her into the bargain, even though they then try to get her for whatever reason, in that moment, it has always felt kind of protective, and I. I, I've always gotten this vibe from it, at least for me, when he says it, I'm always like, aw. Like, <laughs> like <laughs> it, it well, just it, comes off as like he doesn't want her to see what's about to happen. You know, <laughs> like, she's an innocent. She shouldn't see that. And then, of course, and then, like, 30 seconds later, they're they're chasing her around the house. But it's still, in that moment, I'm like, aw. Like, <laughs> which is, you know kind of dumb but uh one issue i have is with julia and the second one it's she's much softer it's much better you know i i prefer her in hellraiser 2 in hell in the original hellraiser she's so incredibly severe um just like her makeup is very severe her her jewelry is severe her haircut her clothing and i know that that's one the way that it was i mean that's just the way like with the shoulder pads and everything in the hair like that's that was that was the fashion of the time you know and i know that and also there i think they purposely attempted to create a severity about her character because she's you know a bitch but <laughs> it it just is off-putting to me. I, yeah. I think, and I'll let me stop you right there for a second. Go ahead. Go ahead. But, um, you know, as as Frank's got more and more um, bodies in him, as easy as he is, more and more he fed, the more and more he came together, the more and more extravagant her wardrobe became. I think throughout the movie, if I remember correctly, and uh, I, I think that you know, this is a film about temptation, about you know lust, and the more and more he got his body back, the more and more she lusted after him because he wasn't so gross anymore, you know? Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, it's almost kind of biblical the way that they have treated lust and adultery as, you know, bringing on demons. Oh, yeah. And, and, that, and you know what? That is an aspect about it that I do enjoy. I don't... I don't... Agree, I don't... Ah, oh, man. I, to me, sexuality is not a bad thing. I think, you know, the adultery part, sure. Like, you know, that's bad. Especially when you're willing to basically murder your husband for a, this other person who is a dick. You know, I mean, it's not like he's it's not like he's a good guy. Um, and even if he was, it'd not be okay to murder your husband. But what I mean is it's just there's really nothing good about the choices that she makes. There are no good choices here. <laughs> like, it's just... It's, well, you know. I, I mean, Julia is, in her core, a selfish and yes. heartless person. You she know, is. she she banged Frank because, well, you have to admit, he was hot and he was the bad boy. And, yeah, and when he is... Um, there's a particular scene where I'm not sure if it's the scene where he comes to the door and she answers the door and he's standing there. If it's that scene where he just looks like really like I, I get it. I'm a, I'm a heterosexual, but he's, he's standing there in the rain in the, the rain, like, yeah. Like, like, like it, it looks like a, the white person's version of Jerry Curl hanging down, you know, <laughs> with, with, with an open shirt going on. Yeah. It looks like something yeah. out of I'm looking, Frank. you know. Yeah. Hi, I'm yeah. Frank. You want to fuck? No, but not really. <laughs> <laughs> you know. But in that, in that little flashback scene. Oh, sorry. No, I would. Go ahead. 
Now, I was just going to say in that flashback scene, Julia is, her features are much softer. Oh, that's exactly what I was going to say. I mean, this, so that is exactly what I was going to say. So, and I had a feeling that's what you were going to go with. So that's, um, yeah. Sorry, I mean, JP. To, to, no, no, no. I'm glad you brought it up because that means I'm not crazy. So um, to, to Gary's point, you know, when you said that she, um, that she got more severe as, as it went on. Yeah. That's what I was going to say is like back in those flashback scenes, her hair was longer. It was a softer hairstyle. Her makeup was much softer. She looked more, um, like homey for, for lack of a better word, like feminine, like, um, what's the word? I'm not trying to, uh, I guess more I, feminine. I, I, I don't know. I, I know what you're trying to say because I, I see the same thing. Cause they, she was softer. And that's yeah. all I can think I mean, of. That's she the best much way. softer. I guess that's the best the best way to describe it. Yeah, she just she was much softer. And then as we see her going, she gets hardened almost. And then I kind of have the imp- I get the impression that she wasn't bitchy in the beginning. You know that when they first got together, that maybe it was the introduction of Frank to her life and the temptation of him and her succumbing to that temptation just hardened her and turned her into this like stone cold bitch, you know, I, um, at least that's the way I interpret it. But, um, I, I just don't, I, but, and I, so I get the look and the point of the look and it makes sense. I just find it off putting cause I don't think it's attractive, you know? So like when she's going to the bar to pick up the guys to bring back for Frank, I don't think she's attractive in those scenes. And and the men are like falling all over themselves. And I'm like, I don't get it, but whatever. Um, you know, like, yeah, I guess that's your thing. I but- mean, the, the one thing they did to emphasize that in that one scene with, I can't remember the kind of chubby bald guy. And she was just wearing those, I swear they look like starfish earrings. Earrings. Yeah. Yes. And it was just, everything was so sharp pointy. Yeah. And sh- yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like there was nothing, there was nothing rounded or soft or curvy about anything. It was everything came to a really harsh point and um, it was very severe. And um, so, yeah, they did a good job. I mean, that, that's definitely a good job. I just don't find it a visually appealing, you know. But, uh, yeah, this movie, I, I've always loved this movie. I've always been attracted to anything that... Um, that deals with temptation or um, the human sexuality or anything like that, you know, that kind of attempts to dive into who we are as human beings and anything sexual. And this, this film like it goes at that, like it, it attacks that. And I think it does it in just a really uh, original, cool way. I love the sounds of the chains and the, and there, the creaking, and then when you see the lights coming through the slats, I mean, all these things are very Hellraiser. And in the, even later into the sequels, they'll use them. They don't use them to the same effect. And it, it feels like later on, like they're put in there because they have to be. Like, oh, well, if this is a Hellraiser movie, you got to have lights through the slats. You know, it's either that or an alien invasion. Um, <laughs> but um, they just put them there because they're checking off a box. But here it it feels like it belongs. And the gore, like this is the the when Frank is becoming Frank again, the whole transformation, which is an incredibly slow transformation, when from the time that we first see him where he's just like pulpy flesh, Mm. it is one of the few films where the gore actually disturbs me. And uh, yes, it, it's it it kind of it gets under my skin, but in a really good way. I like it, but it gets under my skin, and it, it looks painful for one thing. Yeah, it absolutely does. Yes. Yeah, that's the big thing that gets me with that scene. Well, the Ooh. one thing I I have to say about this soundtrack, and then I'll shut up. I'm sorry, but the one thing I love about the score mm-hmm. is those little tinkling bells mm. in the background. That mm-hmm. is the one thing that. I, I still have the sound, the the score on vinyl. Yeah, I like dumb. And those those little tinkly bells in the background really fuck me up. I used to play I, I, years and years ago. I dated a guy who um, gave me a huge set of of 
film scores that he had like he that was in he had a collection and he put them all on disc for me and i used to play them while i was writing uh back when i would write like editorials and stuff like that and the <coughs> hellraiser theme is one that i played a lot because it's just it's so moody and it's so atmospheric that it it would just i loved having it going in the background yeah so yeah, and I love the tinkling in the background, and then the, and the. I actually have it. I have a Halloween CD somewhere, like a compilation that I actually bought, and that that theme is on that compilation, which is kind of weird, but um, but at the same time, it fits. You know, it's cool. So, um, there was something else I was gonna say, and I don't remember what it was, other than I absolutely love it. But shoot, um, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I I think I pretty much talked about everything. I could go on and on and on, but you don't oh, really need me to. It's it's. I it's I know how you feel. Damn good. <laughs> it's just damn good. Oh yeah, Hells are Hellraiser for me was um, it was a rental. You know, when I was became less of a pussy about horror films, and I it's one of those films I didn't realize what was going on entirely until I got older. Let's put it that way, because I I watched it as a kid probably 10, 11 years old, it went back into my 20s, and then you start to see all the little subtext of shit, like, like Julia's relationship with Frank, which is basically because, you know, Larry, uh, Andrew Robinson, his brother, I mean, he's like one dad joke away from being like this milquetoast guy, so I can see why she would go for Frank, because she, she was probably, she, you could, like, you mentioned the flashback scene, I mean, her hair, her, her, her hair is a mess, her clothes are kind of tattered a bit, you could tell she was bored to tears with this fucking milk toast motherfucker. That's why when she met the stallion known as Frank, that she 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 had to get that. And to the point of when he's brought back from, and it's this it's the little shit in this movie when they're bringing the mattress up the stairs, and the part where Larry's arm gets caught on the nail, which is the blood that rebirths Frank, the 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 the. Um, the, them showing the 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 flesh being torn up close like that that shit makes me cringe every time you know just it's just it's a small thing but it's an it's an amazing thing to watch it's it's, it's um mm-hmm. it's just gross and, oh i know what i was going to say sorry you just reminded yeah. me that um when she hits the guy with the hammer and then it pulls away and there's like a little piece there's like a little tuft of hair and blood on the end of the claw that's oh, I a know. nice that's a nice touch you know, and it just kind of add. It makes it that much more painful. Like it, it makes it feel that much more painful. You know, because like oh, there's like hair and blood on it. That's gross. And but it was a really nice, nice thoughtful touch. I thought that was what I was going to say. Sorry. Cool. That's fine. Um, yeah, Frank himself is is you know I, I love the scene where he's just like hang, when he finally just put clothes on, he's just having a cigarette. Like yeah, I just sucked some dude dry. Now I got to have a cigarette. It's it's almost like again. It goes back to like almost like over, overly sexualizing everything and him, you know, I guess sucking the marrow out of these dudes because I really like the look of them when they're all, you know, all sucked dry or whatnot. They're really, you know, uh, uh, they look like just husks. Yeah, it's it's really, mm-hmm. really bad, man. And I'm not gonna give anything away, but you know, the, the look, the look, uh, I should because everybody's seen this goddamn movie. The look of the Cenobites. I know the the female Cenobite did not want to make the second one. Because the makeup was so painful to keep on for as long as they had to keep it on. And I think it took like at least six or seven hours to just apply the makeup. And she wasn't feeling it. So uh, Barbie, um, I forget her last name, replaced her in the Wild. second film. Barbie Wild uh, replaced her in the second film. And um, But the look of the chatterer fucks with me still to this day. And I, I will say this about the cast. If you ever got to meet at a convention, they always do a lot of conventions. And Nicholas Vince... The guy who plays the Chatterer is like one of the nicest guys you ever want to meet in your life. He's got a long beard, and he's just a jaunty fellow, and they all look <laughs> yeah, he is. Man, yeah. it's, it's, But he's like this terrifying figure on the screen, just rattling them teeth and scaring me as a small child. And the, the, the part we get at the end, which, you know, Edgar Robinson, I mean, <clears throat> when Frank takes his, 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 his skin for his own, and Kirsty realizes what's going on, and um, 
what's Claire Higgins' name? What's what's uh Ju- Julia gives gives like the maniacal laugh in a way, like yes, we we planned this the whole time. You know, it's it's kind of like she's like a supervillain in a way. Cause she's kind of like basically um, perpetrate this whole thing to get Frank, her her lover, back to life. And I'll I'll have to say, and I mentioned this too when when I met him. Andrew Robinson uses that come to daddy line in Transfers Three when he shows up in that movie as the bad guy. Yeah. And he just he just laughed out loud when I mentioned that because he knew just what I was talking about. And the the end, the very end, where you know you, this this is not for your eyes. If you don't know what happens. Frank is stretched. All of his skin, all of his everything is stretched by chains, and all you see is his stretched out face, and he lets out the line, Jesus wept. This is a scene I turn on people, you want to see some gross people, that's not, that's kind of tame. I turn on that scene, and when the, the, the flesh is ripped by the chains, and they just show everything, that's real fine and good, and I love it. But, you know, there's certain effects in this film, and I've read that the effects budget was small, but there's certain things that I would not have included in this film. Like that, that monster on the rolling cart that rolls down the hallway, because it, it looks dumb. Um, it, just, it just looks really dumb. Like here's something to scare you that's gonna flail his arms around. And um, the creature at the end, the the, the 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 hobo you see throughout the film turns into, looks like the creature from the end of the Golden Child, and I can't stop laughing. Oh yeah. I just yeah, I can do I, that. Yeah. <laughs> My dear sweet brother Nomsi, I can see that every time. The, just the creature from the Golden Child and. It's just little stuff like that. And this, that's the only real flaw of this movie is some of the jankier special effects like that, which I love stop motion. So I love that creature a little more than I say because the stop motion with that creature for like the five seconds that you get him and the uh, stop motion with the box is really effective for me that it starts going by itself. Um, but Kirsty as a character is, oh, first of all, this film's not really about her in this film. She's just, she's just in the middle of all this stuff with her, with her stepmom and her, her dead uncle, and her, her father. She's just kind of a um, um, a viewer of all this. Whereas in the second film, she has a much bigger role. But So I can't really... Sorry about that. Hate on her for, for doing the stuff she does in this film, which basically, she, she, keeps, she, she keeps changing her deal with these Cenobites, so I, I can see why they would want to have her as well at the end of this movie. And uh, I love it, though. It's great. I mean, I, I can see why it's Stone Cold Classic. They get a little sillier t- towards the, the the sequels, and that's okay. But um, I'm done talking about Hellraiser. I think you guys should see it if you haven't seen it. And if you haven't seen it, I think it's on Amazon Prime right now for you to watch. So um, that's about it for me. And uh, Suzanne, anything else you want to say about it? And what do you give it 1 to 10? Now, I remember, um, once again, I watched this when I was in high school, and I took this current affairs class. So there was, there was like seven of us in the class. It was super tiny. So... Monday, we would all go around the room, talk about what we watched or what we did over the weekend. I took up 20 minutes of class time talking about Hellraiser. So, yeah, this movie changed the look of horror for me. And I've always, I've told everyone, I grew up watching horror movies with my mom. I grew up watching The Twilight Zone with my mom. And this movie, once again, just seriously... You had everything going on in this movie and the score, the look, the fact that it was, there was not a a thin part of the plot. Yeah, I I, I see the the janky skeleton demon at the end that flies up out of the fire. I like the stop motion though. I like the stop motion. Yeah. No, I, I still, I'm like, I, I'm still okay with that. I don't care how janky it looks. It had, it had a $1 million budget. That's all it had. So you can't really complain about it. Oh, I know. It. They did most of their makeup effects with latex condoms and KY jelly. So whenever you are looking at that little drip on Frank, thank you, KY. But no, this movie, I rarely, I hate giving out the, the 10, but just because this movie changed a lot and I talked about it, constantly everyone thought it was fucking psychotic but yeah this is this is one of the few movies that gets a straight up 10 out of 10 it's amazing in every aspect jamie i cannot disagree with that it also gets a 10 from me this is a pure classic all the way unfortunately i can't say that the sequels continued that but <laughs> Um, some of them, some of them bet more than others, but nah. 
But this this one, Let me tell incredible. I'm breaking ahead of myself. I didn't hate Hellraiser Judgment like people hated it. I, I, I thought that. You know what's funny? Been... The funny the first time I saw it, I, um, I didn't. I didn't hate it. I. Oh, you know what I said the first time? I, I don't think I ever watched it a second time. But um, <laughs> uh, but I didn't. I didn't hate it. Uh, I would be interested to see how I felt about it if I watched it now, uh, you know, watched it again. I, uh, but I, I don't... I had a conversation with the guy with the okay. new Pinhead, and I, I said the way the script was constructed, I think you, you as Pinhead mi- being minimal worked really well, and he was totally... <laughs> No, it's you have to watch it, Suzanne. To get what I'm talking about, though, because it's not about it's not really about I, him. I just I saw some of the stills. I'm like, I cannot watch Hillsbury Doughboy Pinhead. No, no, not that one. The one after it. Oh, okay. The one, the one after it. That's Hellraiser Revelations. This one is about totally different characters. Where Pinhead shows up at yeah. some point in the movie, but oh but wait, is this very... one about the journalist? No, no. This is no. a um, what's the guy called that act that eats the paper and throws up um. Yeah, that's the one I'm, I, I cannot remember. The, yeah, the, I watched this one, okay. and I I remember it, and I think I really liked it. The one thing I didn't like about the it was the end, and it was the whole angel angle with yeah, it wasn't the, needed. It wasn't needed. No, I didn't like that, but I really but didn't like hate the rest of it. It was like two years ago that it came mm-hmm. out. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, I, I remember watching that one, and I I think I turned it on kind of as a hate watch. <laughs> and then you're and like, oh, I, damn it, I don't hate it. <laughs> I don't hate it. I, yeah, to me, I it's the best it. one they've done in, in, um, in uh, well, a very, Ever? very, very, very fucking long time. So, yeah, but I, it I'm was sorry. actually written, it was actually written as a Hellraiser film, um, at least as far as I know, whereas the majority of the sequels were not. So, there's that. Um, I interrupted Jamie, though. I'm sorry, Jamie. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, I interrupted too. I apologize. No, I interrupted you. <laughs> oh no, because I was talking about my rating. Okay. Yes. Um. <laughs> sorry, I. Uh, but well, I mean, I was pretty much done. I. This is. It's a ten. It's a ten for me. It's one of those. Uh, it's an essential. You know, it is uh, one of those films that I will always own in some way, shape, or form, and it. I really, really, really want. I've always wanted the Lament configuration box set, but it was um, at the time when it came out. It was um, I didn't have uh, a way to watch it because it was a region. It was a UK release, and now it's too fucking expensive. So um, because they don't make it anymore, and it's incredibly expensive. So I I don't own it, but. I hate that because I always thought it was such a badass release, you know, that in like, I know all, you know? Yeah. My, in my all region player decided to die on me after I'd had it for 18 months. Oh, wow. So now all of my region B movies and others, I can't watch until I get another one and they're frightfully expensive. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, I would actually maybe I should look up that box set now and see if I can find it on eBay or something. But it it was at a time I looked it up a couple years ago to see if I could find it if anybody was selling it, and it was uh, the only ones I could find. People were unloading for like two hundred bucks, and I'm like, oh, yeah. <laughs> like yeah, I don't no. need that bad. <laughs> it's like my the two things I want I want that box set, and I also want that leather the red leather edition. Of Suspiria. It was oh, German yeah, release only. Yeah. yeah. And the last time I saw it, it was 200 bucks on eBay, but unfortunately did not have $200 to spend at the time. Yeah. Mm. So that makes me sad. But, um, but yeah, it's an assumption. <clears throat> it's, uh, Sorry, excuse those, me. it will always be on a list of if people ask me, well, if I want to be a horror fan, what movies do I need to watch? Well, I have a list of, I should probably update it. It's about 15 years old. But I had, about 15 years ago, I made a list of 100 movies that I would give to people who ask what movies they should watch if they wanted to get into horror. And um, that is really high up on the list. Yeah, it's up there. I mean, you know, I, I'll, I'll say that, you know, it's, he's iconic. You know, the, the, the Cenobites that in, in question are iconic. But Doug Bradley has such a commanding, you know, performance in the, the, the little bit that he, he's in this movie. Because if you're looking for a whole lot of cinematic action, you're looking to watch this movie. 
they're only in it for a little bit, but there's it's the little stuff I love. Christopher Young's score is spectacular. Um, oh god, there's 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 we talked about a lot. You know what? Though so you don't notice that they're not there that much. I mean, they're not, but okay. they're there. The they're there as much as they need to be. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I think it's hilarious. Uh, so I have to be trivia. Uh, the term Cenobite is a word meaning a member of a communal religious order. The Hellbound Heart specifies that they are members of the Order of the Gash, which is, you know, more, sounds more sexual as you think about it, you know, because you know, Gash oh shows before. Yeah. Uh, but, um, yeah, it's, it's a 10. I mean, it's 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 perfect film to watch as far as, like, like, like Jamie says, it, it's essential. If you haven't seen Hellraiser... You need to find a way to watch it because you need to rectify that if you're a horror fan or a budding horror fan. Um, I'd no, recommend it's it. It's quintessential. It is quintessential horror viewing. Big words, quintessential synergy. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, that's it for this one. We're going to come right back and we're going to close up the show. If you enjoyed this show, then make sure you check out the other great shows on the Legion Podcast Network, like Cinema PsyOps, Cinema Beef, Devour the Podcast, Duncan and Bo Come Correct, Exploding Heads Horror Movie Podcast, Friday the 13th, Get Slayed, The Hell Mean Power Hour, Hello, This is the Doom Show, Hero Hero Ghost Show, Kill the Cast, Underwater Kaiju from Outer Space, Jerry Hates Action, Legion After Dark, Metal Health, Obsessive Cinema, Discourse, Pick Six Movies, The Podcast by the Cemetery, The Podcast on Haunted Hill, The Psycho Semantic Podcast, Rick Radio, House of Wax, Dude Looks Like the 80s, Rabbit and Red Radio, The Shade Cast, Short Bus Cinema, Two Drink Minimum Commentaries, The VD Clinic, Who Will Survive Horror Podcast, and Which vs. the Doomsday Clock. With such a widespread of shows, there is guaranteed to be a niche for you to fall in love with. Horror, politics, movies, books, sex, music, commentaries, health, video games, kaiju, action, news, comedy, and opinions that would most likely get you killed in some parts of the world. We are proud to bring you some of the best podcasting in the world. Check us out at www.legionpodcast.com, iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, YouTube, and any other dark corner of the internet where podcasts can be found. I know we haven't done a death segment in a while, but uh, I'll mention one person um, in, in the death segment because it was he was kind of a big deal in my child. Like, I used to watch a lot of stuff that he was in, the little stuff he was in. Uh, David Paul, one half of the Barbarian Brothers, it passed away. I mean, these guys were, were bodybuilders, but they, they started acting in movies in the 80s. Stuff that I watch and stuff from the Finn to shows one day, like DC Cab they were in. So, and um, yeah, he was a... a, a musician he he was a animal lover he was lots of things and i remember fondly and i his brother's kind of insane on facebook so if you try to talk to him about anything he just goes kind of goes off a little bit um but um i remember them fondly i seen i remember some film that they were in where they were truck drivers these are all like family oriented films except for of course mr diodato's the barbarians uh which stars richard lynch them and Michael Berryman with an erect horn, uh, where their voices are terribly overdubbed, but very fun nonetheless. A sword and sandal movie, um, yeah, just fun, fun loving guys in those movies. And I'm glad they, they live full lives considering, you know, how, how young he died. He seemed like he did a lot with his life. And sad thing about his, his great Dane died a couple of days later, so now they're now they're together again, yeah, very sad. Oh my god! But uh, Jamie got a lot going on. Uh, tell the folks where they could find all your good stuff. Well, uh, lately we've spent a lot of time on the Cut to the Chase podcast, Brian and I. Every time we go see a new movie, um, Dan and Lacey just uh, they'll be see they'll see it too. So we're like, hey, you want to talk about it? We're like, oh, okay, so we'll talk about it. So we've been on there quite a few times. Um, and I never I never get to listen because I don't see these new movies. I saw Midsummer like way after you guys reviewed it, and I wanted to go back and listen. But oh, you, know, you said pro- that was a f- we had a good time with that review. Uh, I did too, uh, and I, I thought it was funny. You know, the movie was funny in parts to me, but uh, oh yeah, it was. Comedy. Uh, we <laughs> uh, we uh, have an X episode for ABCs that I've been sitting on. Work has been really nuts. Um, 
well, I don't have that problem right now. So <laughs> there are going to be a lot of podcasts coming out. We've got a whole bunch of Colossal Collections that I'm going to be getting out. We have a like in it. We have the ABCs that's coming out. And I'm going to have a whole lot of time to work on that stuff. So it's uh, finally going to get done. So that's exciting. Um, every week, uh, Brian just gave me the thumbs up. He is, <laughs> he is so anxious. He's <laughs> um uh, every week uh, on Wednesday, the Married with Children podcast drops, so you can catch me on there where we talk about Married with Children. And I think, I think that's about it. I think that's everything I've been. I mean, really, I haven't been. The only the regular thing I've been doing lately is Married with Children. And um, other than that, I'm just really behind on other stuff. And then, of course, been popping up on, like I said. Cut to the chase. If it weren't for those guest spots, no, nobody would have heard me for a long time, probably. Um, also was fortunate enough, though, to be invited to be on Exploding Heads when they, they were doing a celebration of women in horror. And they asked Lacey and me on to be on the same episode. And that was fun. We had a good time. I talked about some really great movies. Triangle, which I love. Um, the Mutilator, which is fun. And... I actually don't remember what the third one was, but I, and they're not related at all. Um, Cause I was sitting here trying to figure out how the hell is a mutilator related to triangle. It's not, they were, they were uh, suggested by patrons. So that's why they were on that show. But I'm like, what it doesn't make any sense, <laughs> but they're no, they were just fun movies. So that's pretty much it. We just, Oh, there's one thing that's exciting. I forgot if you need some quarantine reading, if you find yourself stuck at home and bored, then I highly recommend that you seek out a copy of Summer of Lovecraft uh, from Dark Regions Press. That is Brian's latest book that uh, he edited, and he well, he also has a story in it, but, um, and I have a story in that one. And these are all uh, mythos stories that take place in the 60s. So you've got stories about cults, you've got stories about hippies, you've got stories about drugs, you've got a story in the voice of Hunter S. Thompson, you've got my story, which is about uh, basically about reproductive rights, you've got um, all sorts of things in there. If it happened in the 60s, it's probably mentioned in one of these stories in this book. And it's honestly not, it has nothing to do with the fact that I'm in it. It just happens to be one of my favorite anthologies that Brian has ever put together because I love when he does these really cool themed anthologies. And I think this one hit it out of the park. So, um, and uh, you can pick that up at Dark Regions Press or even on Amazon. And I highly recommend it if you love Lovecraft and, or if you have never read Lovecraft and you want to see what the mythos is all about, or maybe dip your toes in, you know, give it a shot. Ooh. Suzanne. Oh, NFW, we are doing snake movies, which, you know, my favorite sub eco terror genre. So that would be a sub sub genre. So, yes, yeah, so we just wrapped up on Anaconda 2 Hunt for the Blood Orchid. And I well, guess we we're just go to- watched Anaconda uh, because it's an A movie, you know? <laughs> <laughs> you know, the, honestly, Anaconda 2 would have been better if they had removed the snakes and left it just an adventure story. But Yeah, yeah I could see that. Yeah. If it wasn't for the the really shitty Anaconda CGI, oh. it would have been a good movie. But yeah, I was going through snake movies. We're going to do my favorite Dirk Benedict movie. You, the movie you hiss and not say. Mm-hmm. And we just wrapped up on Jaws of Satan as well. So oh, look for that. To, and uh, a, a random weird thing that I bumped into on Amazon, if you're also quarantined, I <laughs> read this book like years ago and, and I just reread it again. It's called Something's Alive on the Titanic. Don't get that whole James Cameron shit stuck in your head. This book was published, I think, in like 1992 by this man named Robert Serling. So, of course, I've got that local thing with Rod Serling. I did not even realize that Robert was his older brother, who wrote a very interesting story about people going to try to explore and 
exploit the Titanic. Excellent super, supernatural novel, well written, fun as hell, really creepy at points. So do yourself a favor and check out this little book. Did they find the heart of the ocean? <laughs> <laughs> oh, they found something worse. That actually sounds very interesting. I would I would like to check that out. It's I promise you, it is really good and I I'm harsh. I've read a couple of really good books. No, I can't find anything to read to save my life. Oh, well, you know what What I've heard is really good? It's this book called Summer of Lovecraft. <laughs> I, you know, it's funny. I, I, I actually just pulled it up on my Kindle. So you know what? I think I know what I'm going to be reading later. Oh, sweet. Uh, <laughs> this, well, I would be interested to, to, I would be interested to see what you think, especially since um, you, you, you are very opinionated, but I like that. Because you don't pull any, you don't pull any punches, and when it comes to something like that, I I like honesty. So I'll be interested to hear what you think, and I can't wait to hear the show on Jaws of Satan because that movie. <laughs> oh my god! Oh that my god! A hoot! <laughs> I went through hell because uh, it went out of print from Shout Factory. And I scoured the ends of eBay and Amazon trying to find a cop, a reasonably priced copy of it. Because it is, it is, oh my God, I actually went off on a tangent throwing out snake facts. So yeah, I went a little crazy there. Well, that'll be a fun, that'll be a fun listen for me then. Yeah, me. This show, Burning for Springwood. The two drink minimum commentaries could all be found on legionpodcast.com with all the other great Legion shows as well. And, uh, yeah, I, I have, um, made this master list of shows. I think I have 67 in total. I mean, let me look, scroll down and look at it right now. I love to see what we're doing next. I have no idea what that's going to be though, but there's 67 to choose from right now, which I'm going to circulate to different podcasters to see if they want to come on the show. Make, make it real exciting, y'all. Cause I, I, I'm, I'm kind of proud of this list, actually. So I hope my co-hosts are proud of it, too. Because you can get excited about it, too. Um, but yeah, that's happening. And um, Fleas and Flicks charity auction. Still waiting for a couple things to come in. Yeah, I decided to go after a couple more things before, you know, the convention, you know, drought comes through because it's going to happen. There there have been postponing conventions. I think they postponed, like, four today. So I'll be making out too, too many of those. I really don't go until August anyway, so... I'm sorry for the folks who are missing theirs. I know Alex and um, Jerry V. How do you spell Jerry? How do you pronounce Jerry's last name? Not not Harry and Jerry v- with with a V. Vitetta. Vitetta. They were supposed to go to Monster Mania this weekend. Yeah. Got got postponed. So yeah. Fucking Corona. Fucking shit up. See. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was so sad. Alex was so excited. He already had his podcast lined up that he was going to listen to on the trip to Monster Mania. And I'm talking like the night before he was planning to leave. Mm-hmm. And, oh. and and then it came through that it was canceled. And it just, oh, <laughs> it just broke my heart <laughs> for him, you know, because he was so excited. Oh, oh I forgot. I'm on a, now on the Hard to Kill podcast with, with, with Alex and Nudie. So there's that. That's on the Horophilia Network. Sorry I didn't mention that, but um, we talked about Alex and it came out now, see? Wait, what's that? I haven't heard of that. Why haven't I heard of that? That is an action commentary podcast. What? No I one has that. told me about this. Yeah, I don't the last think. One, the, the last <laughs> one we did was Uncommon Valor. The next one that we're going to do is Tango and Cash. Oh, wait. No, no. I take that back. I do remember I do remember something about that. Never mind. I've, I've, I've had a lot going on, so things go in and out of my head sometimes, but... <laughs> You're right. Oh, I'm going through the master list now, and I'm like, wow, there are a bunch of movies. There are some really good ones here. Cool. I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad you approve. But um, that's about this. But for this one, I'm uh tired, y'all. But this has been Sin Beef Podcast. Where if you got beef, we've got the grinder. See y'all next time. Next time. Next time. Next time. Next time.